Hello and welcome to the Mark Rose Podcast. Today's guest is someone whose story I heard and I was extremely moved by. I think it's a very important thing to recognize why we want to change ourselves or alter ourselves. It, it, this ideal self or this idea of seeking perfect, where does the idea of perfect come from or the idea of what our body should look like and what the shape of a part should be and all that. And it's not to shame the desire to do it. It's not to shame the choice to do it. It's to explore where does the motivation come from and is the actual industry that's motivating us to do that, marketing to us, which ideal self comes from social media, marketing, movies, magazines, Pinterest, you know, all the places. It's shaped for us in some ways. And then status is given for looking that way or being that way. And imagine if the actual places that are doing the work on us are actually not fully educated in that space themselves. And then the risk and cost of that. And so Jessica's story is a very personal one. Um, and, and so I was really excited to have Jessica Pinn on the podcast to share her journey and to bring some more awareness to us and motivate us to hold organizations and people accountable before we jump into today's episode, one way that you could support the podcast is to, wherever you listen to it, subscribe to it, leave it a five-star review, a written review if you can, and if the episode resonates, please share it. And so, without further ado, here is Jessica Pitt. All right, well, I am so excited to have Jessica Pinn on the podcast. Jessica is an advocate for better... Edu medical education on clitoral anatomy and health. And so that sounds like a really important subject that we should uncover for so many reasons. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So what led, because, you know, this like is a very specific uh, space of expertise and obviously an important one. I'm really curious, what led you to want to teach this and, and and make sure that there is more medical education and just education in general on the anatomy of it? Well, when I was 18, I had a labiaplasty and a clitoral hood reduction was done without my consent and my surgeon severed the dorsal nerves of my clitoris and I lost clitoral sensation permanently. Um, at least most of it, I lost sensation in the glands, which is the head of the clitoris. After my surgery, doctors told me that that couldn't have happened. They told me that I just needed to relax or that I just needed to fall in love. So, whoa, whoa. talk about gaslighting. Yeah, so I realized that there was a lot of ignorance of anatomy among doctors. And there were a lot of other issues too. Like I realized that I had sought surgery based on misinformation that was published by doctors. And I, you know, yeah, there are many issues with what I see as systemic negligence where female sexual function is concerned in medicine. Mm -hmm. And also there are no training standards for female genital cosmetic surgery and female genital cosmetic surgery is marketed with misinformation. But I decided to focus on clitoral anatomy because I felt that that was the biggest gap in medical education. And it seemed like that was what had affected me most. And also because I feel like it just has such wide reaching implications that clitoral anatomy is not adequately included in medical education. So that is what I have been focusing on. Yeah, it's so true. Like in the, even when growing up, you know, in the education that I got in school, there's First off, I went to Catholic school, so they were terrified of talking about anything to do with pleasure or any space that might provide pleasure. Uh, but there was no education on that. I think the actual education I got surrounding the clitoris was through the internet. And it was because my sister told me that I needed to learn <laughs> about it, uh, which you know is good advice from an older sister. And it's interesting in the aspect of what you were saying about misinformation generating this uh, maybe misguided or, or uh, a desire to get uh, plastic surgery in that space. What was the misinformation 
that that you see so prevalent that or it, I'm guessing there's lots but yeah if you could just point out some of it just so we can identify it you know when we're driving down the freeway and you see these plastic surgery uh, ads on on the side of billboards which is crazy to me um, but yeah if you could share so the most common one is how labiaplasty is called rejuvenation that is actually fraud given that there have been 10 normative studies that have been done and not one has shown any positive correlation between age and labia minora size in adult women. So we know that large labia minora are not associated with older age. In fact, the labia minora tend to atrophy with menopause and declining estrogen levels, yet labiaplasty continues to be marketed as rejuvenation. So they're saying that as you age, the labia minora gets bigger is the marketing spin that they're putting on it. So come get some plastic surgery so that we can make your labia minora more attractive. And, and is that the premise? Yeah. So labiaplasty involves reducing the size of the labia minora and they call that rejuvenation and rejuvenation wow. means to make young again. And that is basically that is misleading. Um, so I saw that when I was 17, actually, and it led me to believe that I looked old. Wow. They, will, they will also say that protruding labia minora are hypertrophic. Hypertrophy means excessive development. They say that half the female population has hypertrophy. Basically, about half the female population has labia minora that protrude. So it's very, very common. Um, yeah. But what they have done is, you know, they'll say that that's considered unfeminine and embarrassing. And I believed that when I was 17, wow. because I never thought that doctors would misrepresent the truth. I also read that large labia minora were caused by masturbation, excess androgens, which, which are male hormones and sexual activity. And being 17 and raised in a pretty conservative environment, I was mortified because I didn't want anyone to look at my vulva and think that I masturbated, wow. <laughs> even though that's obviously totally normal. Yeah. Wow. So this education being that anything to do with the labia is not being, I guess, what someone is calling an aesthetically ideal, right? Because in order for them to be hypertrophied, they would have to be related to some ideal or some. Well, actually, it, well, in my opinion, hypertrophy actually makes it sound like a medical pathology. Right, it does. Um, because it means excessive growth. And so it's not even about an aesthetic ideal. I think it goes farther than that in implying that half the female population has labia minora that are pathologically large which is not reasonable. And I think it's misleading. I think when women read that, they come to believe there's something really wrong with them on a different level than just not being pretty, right? So right. for me, I really, you know, I got the impression that I was basically de deformed. I mean, it, this, wow. this was worse than just feeling like, oh, like my nose is too big or, you know, something yeah. like that. It, it, it felt worse than that. Especially because it was correlated to uh, sex, the possibility of sexual promiscuity or sex, or just a, being overtly aroused all the time and masturbating and like that yeah. association. Wow. And, and that gets published in peer reviewed medical journals and in major medical textbooks. Wait, that does? Like, um, yes. That idea that the size was correlated to masturbation and yeah, they say that labial hypertrophy is caused by sexual activity and masturbation. There is no evidence for this. And this is a myth that leads a lot of women to be insecure. And there is medical authority behind these myths. And I really think that makes them a lot worse. Um, I know that a lot of women, especially teenage girls, are impacted by myths that large labia minora indicate promiscuity. Yeah. I know recently one 19 year old said she sought a labiaplasty because of memes on Instagram that implied that women who had large labia minora had had a lot of sexual partners. And I think, you know, young women are probably the most affected by this. Cause like 
like I know at my age, if like if someone's like, oh Jessica, we know you masturbate, or Jessica, we know you've had sex with a lot of guys, like I don't, I don't give a fuck. Right. That language. I'm not worried. No, about we it. invite that language here. <laughs> you need to express it. But I think with teenagers, like it's they're much more concerned about that sort of thing, and it affects them on a very deep level. And I have a lot of concerns about that because I really think that a lot of young women are seeking these surgeries. In one study, the average age of women seeking labiaplasty was 23. 66% were virgins. Wow. So you see the power of the marketing, you see the power of the establishment, the power of the medical authority. Because you know what you said about, I never thought a, a doctor would lie to me. Like, why would a doctor misrepresent information? And I remember driving by a billboard, um, I forget where, but it said, get, it essentially was like saying, get Botox or get injections, start now, stay the same age. And I was like, wow, like talk about first the denial of aging being a beautiful process, the rejection of it, this idea that, you know, all plastic surgery really appeals, most of it appeals to this idea uh, with the way it's marketed of rejuvenation, of like maintaining youth. And I've really been thinking a lot about that. Like if we reject our own aging process, which I get that as a male, that's a very, it's easier for me to say because George Clooney has been the sexiest man for like, he just keeps staying sexy and getting older. Yeah. You know, and that sounds funny, but it's totally not fair because there's like this idea from a power or status perspective that an older man with silver hair has more of that that makes him more desirable and a woman is more desirable if she maintains this allure of, um, of fertility, of like youth, the shiny hair, you know, all those things. I'm curious your thoughts on that. Well, I may be different than other women, but personally, I don't find older men attractive. I think George Clooney is an exception. Um, you know, Sandra Bullock is also an exception. She got more beautiful in her 50s, I think. I mean, you know, so there will always be exceptions. I think in general, most people do tend to lose their looks as they age, both men and women. Um, I do think historically women have sought partners with power and resources. Yeah. Um, but I tend to think that a lot of that is cultural and has to do with how maybe women didn't have access to power and resources via independent means. Um, so for me, I, yeah, I personally haven't been attracted to much older men. What we do know is that the average age difference between in couples is three years with the man being three years older. And yeah, that's a little older, but not much older. And we know that gender equality is correlated with a smaller age difference between couples. That makes sense. So that what that really means is that women don't really prefer much older men. I mean, maybe we prefer men that are just a few years older, but not like 10 years older. That tends to be atypical. Yeah, I agreed. I know in some of the research I've read where uh, as women age, they prefer about a similar age difference, like anywhere from around their age to up to 10 years above. And men, the age is like, it just keeps staying, like the bottom part of the age they're willing to be with stays, but as they age, so they might be like 60, but still open to being in a relationship with a 30 year old, which is really fascinating. Well, so I think that this research that you're talking about comes from OkCupid. And what they actually looked at was what ages men and women found attractive yeah. on OkCupid. And I think that women are more biased by looking for a romantic partner, a long-term romantic partner, and men are more open to casual encounters. And so I think that when it comes to uh, men and women's ratings of attractiveness, women are rating men in terms of their attractiveness as long-term partners, and men are thinking more in terms of just who is hot. But I think that if you start talking to men about who they're interested in as a long-term partner, then that number is not, you know, 23, no matter how old they are. So I I think that that research gets misrepresented in a way because 
was even like, like even like last week I was on a date with a 39 year old and he said like, oh yeah, like 25 year olds, they're hot, you know? And it's like, he's not against hooking up with them, right? But he wants to be with someone near his own age long-term because, you know, that's who he relates to the most, right? I, I think that there's something to be said for Well, I think a lot of the time people end up with other people like themselves. And I think being close in age is one of those factors. And obviously there are exceptions, you know, but I think in general, people tend to date other people closer to their age. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I appreciate that clarity on the confounding factors in that data, because that certainly makes a lot of sense. I'm curious. I mean, even for myself, like, honestly, when I'm looking, you know, (laughs) Like I have some jokes with my friends about needing to narrow my age range. If I'm just thinking in terms of who I would like to have fun with, then my age range is much bigger. But if I think, uh, if I try to be serious and think, okay, Jessica, you need to find someone to settle down with, then I really narrow that range. You know, then all of a sudden it's like, Jessica, don't waste time with 23 year olds, you know, and this is, this is a challenge for me. But I'm kind of, I'm joking, but like, I love, I honestly, like, I think I have a different attitude than a lot of women because I, I love going out with younger men because they make me feel like I'm still hot, you know? Yeah. So, and I, I love that, but it yeah. may, yeah. Sorry, go on. Oh, it just, it's not necessarily a realistic long-term situation. Yeah, I think about myself at like 22 or 23 and I'm like, oh my gosh, I was so different. I had such different perspective on the world. I didn't communicate well. I, you know, it's aging at least can offer us the opportunity to learn and to grow. And I'm, I'm curious in your experience, like after you left that, that surgical experience, where did, yeah, so like what was the next step and then what lit the fire? Um, as you continued and, and how has the outreach gone? I know that's a lot of different questions. Yeah. Well, after my surgery, it took me a long time to fully understand what happened to me and its significance. And also that it was due to systemic medical negligence instead of just a random accident. Um, I know that within two years, I was telling one of my boyfriends that I didn't think that I could orgasm because of a surgery that I'd had, right? So I was saying that, yeah. yet I still hadn't gotten to the point where I blamed my doctor, I was blaming myself. And I, you know, I didn't understand, you know, these issues where anatomy wasn't getting taught or that I had sought surgery based on misinformation. One funny thing was it was actually in 2007 when I started watching porn <laughs> that I realized that you know, I had not needed surgery. Like I had really thought, you know, that I had needed surgery because I really thought I had this terribly embarrassing problem. And the irony is people always blame porn for the rise in female genital cosmetic surgery, but it was porn that made me realize that I had been totally normal looking before my surgery. And that, and that was sort of, you know, a wake up call for me because I realized that I had been misled into seeking surgery, that there had been nothing wrong with me and that what I looked like after my surgery was definitely not normal. So I had been told by doctors that, you know, when I had expressed concerns, I'd been told that I looked normal and I, you know, my labia minora were completely removed. That's not normal. And one thing that is a bit disturbing is how Um, you know, when I go to the OBGYN, nobody ever says anything to me about it. And I personally think that that should be something that doctors express concern about if they see, because it shouldn't be happening. And I don't think anybody consents to that knowingly, or maybe some people do, but I don't think they realize what they're getting into, if that's what's being done. Yeah, because it's almost like the surgery or the way that the the sur- maybe it's the labia, but also breasts or whatever the surgery might be, that it becomes, it's done through the eyes of the surgeon as to what is the desirable level or amount or whatever. And that's, 
it's fascinating. Like, I'm curious, was your experience mainly with male doctors or was it with both? Well, my original surgeon was male. Um, and he is a very well-respected OBGYN who has held multiple leadership positions and been given awards by other doctors. I was watching a video where a doctor explained that he is a doctor's doctor and he is, you know, like other doctors look up to him and he really cares about his patients. It's really hard for me to listen to that, but that's the reputation that he has. And yet what he did was a surgery he wasn't trained to do on anatomy he didn't know. And he lied about how big my labia minora were before my surgery. And he lied about doing the cl clitoris, sorry, sorry. <laughs> he lied about doing the clitoral head reduction. When confronted by a doctor I had later, um, he said that I must've had a second surgery, but he didn't do it. And, um, and that was a big deal because she tried to get him to admit what he did. He has never admitted it. So then my dad tried to confront him and he said, maybe I did it to myself. So this guy has never taken any responsibility. What he did say was he was just giving me what I said I wanted. Um, and he said he was surprised at how atrophied my labia minora were. So I really think what he did was an accident, at least partly. I don't think that, you know, I, I think he had no idea what he was doing <laughs> and he removed more than he intended to remove. It really is hard to explain. <laughs> um, however, I think what happened was there is a technique that is recommended in one major OBGYN surgery textbook. It's called Baggish Atlas of Pelvic Anatomy and Gynecologic Surgery. The technique is also recommended on up to date. And what it involves is um, putting the labia minora under tension and marking, mar sorry, marking them under tension. And so when they do that, they end up removing more than they intend to remove. Because they like pull it and then mark it. Because they pull it, yeah. And overexcision is actually a really common outcome. In 2010, when I consulted a plastic surgeon on getting new labia minora made, he said I didn't have enough clitoral hood left. But he also said that he sees that all the time because most surgeons don't know what they're doing. Um, because there were no training standards and there still are no training standards. There are no training standards for those for dealing with such a delicate space, but I, you know, all surgeries that are on bodies should be specific and delicate. I'm curious, like, so they have none, there's not like a, Hey, you need to go learn this specific skill, especially around the clitoral hood and the clitoris. Yeah, so people need to understand that clitoral hood reductions are fundamentally clitoral surgeries. They are surgeries on clitoral skin. Most of the clitoral hood is skin of the clitoris itself. Nerves of the clitoris are just beneath the skin. Most surgeons who operate on the clitoral hood don't realize that because they have not been taught about those nerves. Um, there are no training standards for female genital cosmetic surgery. Um, this is something that I think a lot of people don't fully understand. They think that getting a labiaplasty is just like getting, you know, a boob job or a nose job. But, you know, one really big difference is there are no training standards for labiaplasty. There are training standards for all other major cosmetic surgeries. If you go to a board certified plastic surgeon for a breast reduction, for example, you know that they have been trained to do breast reduction in residency you know that they have done a minimum number of breast reductions during their residency under supervision. You know that they have been formally trained in techniques and you know that they've been taught detailed surgical anatomy of the breast. None of that is true for female genital cosmetic surgery. One thing that my father and I have done, so my dad is a plastic surgeon. And one thing that we've tried to do is we've tried to change privileging at surgery centers so that surgeons would have to show that they've been trained in order to get permission to do these procedures in the surgery centers. Mm -hmm. We have been unsuccessful. Why isn't that something that a surgical center would want? Like I would imagine it's a selling feature to say someone's a board certified at, and has taken training on 
the breast, why not on something as important as, as that? Because the professional medical organizations advise that they give privileges to um, board certified plastic surgeons and OBGYNs um, and that those specialties should not have to get extra training. It is Sounds strange. Like <laughs> Sorry? Sounds like they need it. I think that they need it. I think that surgeons should be trained to do the procedures that they're doing. <laughs> I mean, the this problem, is not, you're not asking for something crazy. Like this is just logical. Like this is like, oh yeah, you're going to do surgery around the clitoris. You should know about the clitoris. Yeah. So I'm not entirely sure what the barriers to this are, but I think that until professional medical organizations are offering the extra training that is required for privileging, there will be no incentive for them to, to say that it should be required because they're not making any money from requiring it. Right. And meanwhile, they want their board certification to be sufficient for everyone board certified to do what they want to do. And I think generally doctors do not like having to go get more training. They just want to do procedures and make money. Wow, well, at the cost of, you know, I'm in your now, your research and your expertise in this space, because it sounds to me like you're just like a, you know, every study, every book, every surgical um, manual, I'm curious is, have you, now that you're, you're in the space so much, do you see like tons and tons of women who have gone through this? No. Um, so that is sort of surprising to me because when I look at the literature on female genital cosmetic surgery, it basically proves that a lot of surgeons are operating blind to anatomy um, and you can also see board certified plastic surgeons and board certified OBGYNs describing anatomy incorrectly on real self. And they will be describing it incorrectly in telling patients about risks and also in telling patients who have been harmed that it's all in their heads. However, I really don't get that many stories of women who have been harmed. It may be that those women just don't find me or that they don't feel comfortable reaching out or you know maybe they don't want to talk about it I think a lot of them blame themselves that's been one problem every single time someone reaches out to me they they blame themselves and I have to explain to them that it's not their fault and it's not and it's, it's very fresh sorry it's very frustrating to me how much women blame themselves because what I want is I want women to get angry at the people who are responsible instead of at themselves, because this needs to change. Um, I personally view it as an affront to my dignity that the standard of care has not changed more than it has in the past 18 years. And I personally hate knowing that my doctor could still get privileges to do a labiaplasty today and could still do what he did to me to somebody else and that it would be very hard to pursue any lawsuit against him or get any kind of justice and i want to see that change mm -hmm. have you had the like was there any justice to him in no um one problem is i never you know i i never tried to sue him and I also never reported him to the state medical board. Um, the problem is I didn't really understand what had happened and I didn't understand that there was malpractice until after the two year statute of limitations, which is why every time someone reaches out to me and they say, oh, like my surgeon says that it might get better and all of that, I say, no, you need to look for a lawyer now. Um, but it's very hard because I don't think many lawyers will take these cases. Just yesterday, I texted a law firm to a woman who was harmed. And I said, hey, like, you could try this. And she didn't answer. I don't know what her plans are, but I think it can be very hard. You know, I think the whole process is hard. I know that one woman's case has been dragged out for four years now and she might lose. And I think, you know, the whole 
situation, I think it's very tra traumatic because it involves having to, to talk about something very intimate and private and traumatic. And I don't, you know, there are caps on how much patients can get. And I don't know of any case that's gone to court and won. I mean, maybe there has been one. I've just, I've never heard of that happening. Yeah, you, sorry, go on. Yep, that's pretty much it. Um, the other thing is I never reported to the state medical board. My dad was very cynical about that. He said he thought the board would blame me and take my doctor's side. And so he encouraged me to write to my doctor directly. And it took a very long time for my doctor to respond. And the way he responded was by blaming me and saying a wow. lot of things that were very triggering to me. And, and then I, it's hard to explain, but I was really afraid to report him because of how I was so emotionally affected by his response. I got into this mindset where I was really afraid of my emotions and my, like I, there was a period where I felt a lack of control over my emotions. And so I was afraid of, you know, even just like, I didn't think that I would be able to handle a board blaming me and taking his side. And I was afraid of that outcome. So I didn't report him. Also, there was no statute of limitations back then. So I thought I could just keep putting it off. And then they passed a new statute of limitations and I never saw that coming. So that was what happened. They don't grandfather that. They don't make like, well, before the statute comes in, you're still able to. Uh, no, it didn't work. I tried reporting him anyway, but it didn't work. I tried reporting him for lying about what he did, but they said that because the surgery was more than seven years prior, they couldn't do anything about it. What was the line where you decided to go public? Like, how did that occur? You know, yeah, you'd been holding on to these feelings for so long. And, you know, I think about whenever any of us would enter into the desire to change something, obviously we have a belief that something needs changing. And so then you go and something happens in the surgery and they say, it's your fault. It would make sense that it'd be easy to internalize it and say, Oh, there's something wrong with me. Cause I went into this surgery thinking there's something wrong with me. So perhaps there's something wrong with me even mentally or how I'm processing this or I'm misinterpreting it. I'm curious. Yeah. Like where was the line when, when you're like, fuck this like I'm that's enough well I saw the problem and I wanted to change it in 2010 and actually in my letter to my doctor I tried to explain how I tried to say it wasn't his fault you know I tried to say here is what you did but this happened because you weren't trained and you weren't taught this anatomy and you were led to believe that you were qualified to do the surgery that you're not qualified to do and I asked him to help me change training standards and change OBGYN education. And he, would, but that was my angle. And what I was looking for from him is an apology and help making a change for others. Yeah. And given his status in OBGYN and all the leadership positions he's had, you know, that would have been a really good strategy if he had been willing. He, he wasn't. <laughs> um, and so you know, I, I spent a lot of time very depressed, which now I look back on and, it, you know, it's frustrating that I wasted so much time. Um, what happened is I didn't know how to change things. One thing I did was I wrote this 200 page paper <laughs> explaining the problem and just going over all the literature. I felt like I needed to prove it yeah. because it seemed like no one would believe me. Um, and the people that I talked to, part of the problem was I didn't feel like I could talk to anyone about what happened to me. So it was just my parents and therapists. And it didn't seem like people really understood or believed me. Now my parents are very supportive and my dad, you know, does everything he can to help me. It wasn't always like that. Um, and the therapist that I went to didn't understand um, like in 2011, when I told my psychiatrist that I needed to change, I needed to solve the problem because I needed to make what happened to me positive. Yeah, yeah. He said, you can't make it positive. And it was so strange. And 
I paid one therapist. Wow. I, I paid her to read the paper that I had written. And at that point it was 200 pages long and she read it and she said, why are you doing this? And I felt crazy because in the paper, I explained that surgeons were misinforming patients, that surgeons were not taught anatomy that they operated on. You know, I went over all of those issues and it, it was like, she didn't understand. And what I had expected was I had expected people to be angry and to say, this is not okay. Yeah. And I wasn't getting that. And it, you know, so I, I didn't know what to do. And I think I was afraid I was, yeah, I just, it took me a very long time to figure out what to do and to stop being afraid to take action. I think that I've had a lot of issues with fear of failure in my life that preceded my activism, you know, but so I finally started taking action in December of 2017, I think. Um, and I finally, you know, I met with the head of patient safety at Baylor Hospital in Dallas, which is where my doctor works. Um, and I met with the chief medical officer and I started sending just tons of emails, <laughs> but it took me a long time. Like, and it's, it's sort of embarrassing and it's weird that I think a lot of doctors don't really understand how to change medicine because I asked my dad over and over, I said, who determines the standard of care? Who has the capability to determine what gets taught and how surgeons are trained? And it was weird how hard it was to get answers from my dad. Um, but eventually I figured it out. And so, you know, I started emailing the American Board of OBGYN and the American College of OBGYN and the American College uh, I'm sorry, the American Council on Graduate Medical Education. And, you know, at first I was focused on OBGYN, but I've also focused on changing plastic surgery as well. Like I've gotten the American Society of Plastic Surgeons to update their standardized consent forms. Um, yeah, so I finally wow, started doing- that's incredible. That. Yeah, the way that I took everything public was because, you know, what happened was I was advocating for three months and it didn't seem like I was getting anywhere. And I was just getting increasingly frustrated. And so um, I remember one day I got this email back from a urologist and her name is Dr. Claire Yang and she had published multiple studies on the clitoris. And so I asked her how she thought I could get it taught to OBGYNs. And she said the problem was there was a lack of interest and that she didn't know how to get the information widespread. And so I just, you know, I think I just got exasperated, you know, <laughs> yeah, that even, know. even this woman who is the expert on that anatomy just seemed so cynical about being able to get it taught. Mm -hmm. And it just seems so crazy because it's really basic anatomy and it shouldn't be, it should just, I mean, it should be taught to all medical students. Um, so that's how I took at least my, you know, I, I wrote an article on how the nerves and vasculature of the clitoris are not taught to OBGYNs and the way that I titled that article, I think was inflammatory. And I changed the title to say that it's not in their literature. What and was that, the first title? I kind of, I want to hear it. I said, the first title was OBGYNs are not taught nerves and vasculature of the clitoris. And, and that was a big mistake for two reasons. Number one, it came across as a personal insult to OBGYNs, or at least that's how they took it. Number two, I said, it, I mean, it was, it was true. Yeah. It was true. Yeah. Number two, I said of the clitoris instead of in the clitoris. And what's frustrating is I even asked my dad, I said, dad, should I say of the clitoris or in the clitoris? And he said, oh, of the clitoris is fine. That makes sense. No. Because the problem is that a lot of doctors think that they know the nerves and vessels of the clitoris, and they think that just includes nerves and vessels leading up to the clitoris and not in the clitoris itself. And so that was a fundamental miscommunication because when they saw that, they were just like, of course we know that. Like, how dare you say that we don't know that? But what the irony of that is that they don't know the completeness of it. And so in their own ignorance or like lack of ignorance isn't the right word, lack of education, uh, 
it actually is fulfilling this idea that they know it, even though they're not taught it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. It's like they're not taught it. So when they hear of the clitoris, they're like, we know all of it, but they just, it's actually incomplete knowledge. So based on their incomplete knowledge, they know everything. I mean, it's like if you only taught the nerves and vessels leading up to the wrist and you thought right. that that was adequate anatomy of the hand. Right. Like that, that's not, <laughs> but they just, they don't realize that. So you got picked on for the language you used rather than the actual content of the article that, you know, served as a, hey, we need to learn this. Yeah. I mean, I have been criticized a lot for my tactics and have made a lot of enemies over the years. And, you know, I recognize that I have definitely made mistakes in my wording and I've made mistakes in, you know, how, I guess, how aggressive I've been. Like yeah. sometimes I just get really intense because, you know, because I'm frustrated with this. Like I have anger behind it. And a lot of people just absolutely. tell me, sorry. I said, absolutely. Like, I get it. Like you're angry and you should be angry. You know? That's what I say. But a lot of people tell me that I shouldn't be angry and that I need to heal my trauma so that I come across only from a place of forgiveness and love. Yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> That just feels kind of bypassy, you know, because it's like, just be happy and find the gratitude in it. It's like, yeah, but the rage is important. The rage is what changes things. The rage is what you channeled into writing the articles and writing the 200 page paper and into changing informed consent forms. Like the rage is important. The anger is important. And, you know, as change happens, you know, you're, you're transforming that rage into, you know, um, integrating it in a way as things change. Yeah, I think rage is fundamentally what has motivated me. And yeah. in that sense, I think it's a powerful emotion. It is. At, at the same time, I think sometimes when too much rage comes across in my speech, yeah. it turns people away. But it's very hard for me because I think my personality is a little ragey, you know? <laughs> and I think in that sense, I might be a bit different than other women because I think a lot of women are not comfortable with anger. I, I do think there's a gender difference there and I'm not sure how much it is caused by culture versus biology. There is this one book I read called Rage Becomes Her, which talks about how girls are taught to not be angry. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's this social norm that women aren't supposed to be angry and so I think that women object to anger in other women because of this entrenched social norm. But I don't know if it is just a social norm or if it's also biological um, because you, know, you do see that males are more aggressive. And I do find myself maybe a little bit different because I know like I was a little girl who was beating kids up on the playground and that is like not normal behavior for girls. You know, you know what I mean? Like I was a little girl who got too rough in soccer and didn't understand why I couldn't just knock people over all the time. It was like, right. you know, why are other people so wimpy? Why, why are they crying? Like, I, I, I mean, that sounds kind of bad, but like when I was eight, you know, I was like, you're a kid, you know, and, and you're right. I, I mean, I think you're right from an evolutionary developmental perspective. Um, we, we tell women that they can't be angry. They're too much, they're too this, they're too that, too emotional. Um, and it wasn't safe for women to be angry. If a woman expressed anger, she could die. And that still can be true, you know, in relationships, I mean, in families. And, you know, that's why I think when you bring your concerns to someone else and they say, why are you doing this? It's often because they're also enrolled in the suppression of their own voice. So they wanna suppress your voice. So in not out of ill will, but to like protect you from what could be the cost, you know, but I hear you and I say like my experience of you is a hundred percent. I, I acknowledge your rage and your anger. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry that you've had to go through all of this and who wouldn't get enraged when you've been gaslit, when you're tell people about your concerns, you know, and, and so this, is, it makes sense to me. And I also hear you because like I've, sometimes gotten overtly passionate about something where I get really mad and people don't listen because it triggers their own nervous systems to get reactive and then they can't hear anyways. So I've had to really practice being 
regulated in my passion because there's nothing I want to get enraged too right now hearing what you've been through because I used to work as a pharmaceutical rep. So I've seen that world. I had a, a friend, of, a now a good friend of mine, a guest on here, Dr. Nathan Riley, who is an OBGYN. And I've definitely got to connect you to him um, because he talks about changing the system. And to me, all of this is so important because like I have experienced this too. We like put physicians and medicine in this God category and we don't question it. And for some, you know, and, and they've been put onto this pedestal. And I think it's very important that we humanize them. And we also recognize that uh, things are allowed to be questioned. They must be questioned and they must be challenged because that's the only way that true change occurs. Yeah, I think there's a lot of taboo around criticizing doctors, especially as a layperson. Um, one thing that has been troubling to me over the years is how you're not a doctor has been the way to discredit me. <laughs> but like, so early on when I was sharing my article, um, doctors said that I was wrong and I kept asking anyone to prove me wrong. Yeah. And I then started saying, hey, I will Venmo you $200 if you can find me a source that disproves what I'm saying. And then I kept increasing that until it was eventually $10,000. And what's funny is that I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't establish any credibility even by saying, hey, I'll pay you to prove me wrong. Um, there, there is, I think, a fundamental lack of respect for lay people in medicine when doctors are not willing to provide evidence to support what they are saying. Right. And There's just expected to be, you're, you must be right because you're a doctor. Yeah, yeah, that is the expectation. And in my opinion, you know, there is a problem with declining trust in medicine. 100%. And that is a public health issue. And there have been multiple articles about it. And a lot of the time they will blame, you know, social media, they'll blame fake news, they'll blame an anti science sentiment. Right. And I don't actually think that that is the source of increasing distrust in medicine. I think the reason for declining trust is increased access to medical literature. I think the main difference mm, that's interesting. That is that now anyone with academic library access can read medical journal articles, can read medical textbooks. And there is a lot of misinformation <laughs> in medical literature that can be seen. And that is very clear evidence that doctors cannot always be trusted. <laughs> and yeah. even things that are taken to be true by professional medical organizations, you know, like even professional medical, sorry, even professional medical organizations have misinformed on their websites. And I think in the past, lay people had no ability to question what medical authorities said because they didn't have access to medical information. And what's really funny is that in the original Hippocratic Oath, they instructed doctors to never share medical information with people who are not doctors. <laughs> I think that's very funny because I think that that strategy probably worked for a long time. You know, doctors had a monopoly on medical information. Mm, that's but interesting increasingly they don't anymore. And so there is more ability to fact check the information that we're getting from doctors. And so what I think is that doctors should be trying harder to make sure that what they're saying is true. And there should be a very high standard for you know, correctness in medical literature. And that is lacking. You know, like the fact that claims get published in medical literature that are not supported by any evidence, that should not be acceptable today. Oh, agreed. So what I see in medical literature is a lack of respect for science. And doctors will say people are losing trust in medicine because they're anti-science. But in my opinion, they're losing trust in medicine because they're realizing medicine is often anti-science. Obviously not all the time, you know, 
probably most things that doctors are taught and the doctors tell their patients are true. But I think that these errors that happen need to be taken seriously and they're not taken seriously. When you bring, you know, misinformation medical literature to the attention of editors and authors and professional medical organizations, they tend to dismiss and deny. When I wrote a letter to the editor saying, hey, there is no evidence that excess androgens cause labial hypertrophy. The author responded by saying, whether or not androgens cause hypertrophy is beyond the scope of this paper. If it be, sorry, <laughs> if it was beyond the scope, they never should have published it. Right, they shouldn't even put the information in there unless it's supported by actual data. Yeah. Um, and I haven't tried writing that many letters to the editor, just that one, but I did ask the chief editor of the Journal of Sexual Medicine if I could write a letter to the editor regarding how at least six articles in the Journal of Sexual Medicine mislabeled the clitoris. They mislabel the clitoral body as the glands, which is just like mislabeling the shaft of the penis as the glands, which would be right. obviously ridiculous, yeah. right? The glands is the head. You know, it's like, it's like labeling an arm, a hand in a medical right. journal. It's so bad. And he said he didn't think those errors were serious enough to warrant a retraction or a re-review. But they're pretty serious. <laughs> in my you know? opinion, errors should be taken seriously in medical literature and they should be corrected, you know, and it should be like an emergency to get them corrected, you know. But when I email textbook authors and I say, hey, here's all the misinformation in your textbook, they tend to be sort of like, eh, like maybe we'll try to get that corrected, but I don't know if we can do it. It's like, it should be an emergency to get it corrected. You know, it should be embarrassing that it's there in the first place. Right. And most of all, in my opinion, it is a threat to public health because it causes distrust in medicine, potentially. Amen in the long term. I mean, I, I hear you and I, I appreciate you expressing all of that because the distrust in medicine, when they say that it's because people are anti-science, again, just using the label anti-science dismisses anybody who has a criticism about how science is done. And I think this has especially become rampant in the last two years with COVID, that like any criticism of COVID policy or, you know, it's just gotten exacerbated. And you know, like there's a lot of reasons people don't trust medicine and it's because people die at the hands of medicine. It's because pharma is invested in med medical education. It's because there people have been abused by the medical system. They've been lied to, you know, there's, and saying that people are anti-science if they're, again, you know, criticizing medicine is dismissing and gaslighting all the people who have had very legitimate reasons to not trust. And I, I really love how you express that maybe part of it is just due or a lot of it is due to our access to medical information. I mean, I was trained on how to read clinical trials when I was a rep. I was a rep for 14 years and I read all the trials that came out that I needed to understand to make decisions for myself. And I would trust my own decision. I would go to friends who are physicians or medical experts and ask, like reflect what I think with them. Um, but I really was learning to trust myself to make those decisions. And I mean, you know, most of the physicians and healthcare practitioners I worked with were amazing humans. And I also got exposed to ones who were highly, um, you know, manipulatable, I guess, or influenced by pharma. And, you know, that was my job. So of course that was what I observed. And I recognized how much where money is spent and all that kind of stuff actually influences what decisions are made. And so, you know, you're speaking to a really important topic and I remember studying arousal and desire and like sexuality and all the previous work was done by male researchers and centered that female arousal and desire was basically the same as male arousal and desire and no it's completely different and that was only once there was a broader less male-centric perspective looking at sex and sexuality you know like historically you look at medicine it was very centered around men and especially white men. So, you know, all of what you're saying, I'm just like, yes, yes, yes. And yeah, I'm curious what that brings up for you. 
Well, it brings up multiple things. Um, for one, I really do think that female sexuality should be approached the same way that male sexuality is approached. Oh, interesting. Because, you know, the way that male sexual function and dysfunction is approached is very scientifically, you know, they go over the anatomy and physiology of the penis in detail. And when it comes to female sexual function and dysfunction, they really focus a lot on emotions and hormones, and they tend to skip over anatomy and physiology of female genitals. And so that's how so many doctors could dismiss me when I had obvious damage to my clitoris. Um, one thing that I've tried to do is get literature on female sexual function and dysfunction to take into account anatomy. <laughs> um, what's, you know, what it is like is if you went to the doctor with trouble breathing and they didn't consider what could be wrong with your lungs and they just thought, you know, maybe you have anxiety or something, you know, that is how female sexual function and dysfunction is treated. There's also a lot of focus on lubrication and on desire. Um, you know, they're always talking about how low libido is the problem. I actually had one OBGYN say that anatomy of the clitoris was irrelevant to the diagnosis and treatment of female sexual dysfunction because female sexual dysfunction is caused by low libido. Wow. Another example of this problem is there is an article on the diagnosis and management of female sexual dysfunction on up to date, which is supposed to be up to date and <laughs> It is about 10,000 words and it's authored by an OBGYN at Harvard Medical School. And she mentions relationship 26 times. So she's talking all about relationships, lifestyle factors, body image. And she mentions the clitoris only one time. And all she says is you can put massage oil on the clit clitoris. Never once does she oh, wow. mention that there could be something wrong with the clitoris. And this is just very different from how male sexual dysfunction is approached because with men, you know, they go over how the penis works and they consider what could be wrong with the penis. And it's really the logical thing to do. And I really think there's, you know, the focus on desire, I think is a problem because, you know, there was one woman who lost clitoral sensation and lost the ability to orgasm after a biopsy and in her chart. So she sent me her medical chart and it says she has low libido. It doesn't say anything about what happened wow. to her clitoris. It's really crazy. Um, I also think it's strange that when pharmaceutical companies went to develop the quote unquote female Viagra, they developed a desire drug. In my opinion, the way female sexual function, sorry, the way that female sexual function is assessed is problematic. Um, the main way that it gets assessed is with this female sexual function index, yeah. which is a questionnaire that was developed by a male psychologist. Yeah. It focuses on psychological satisfaction and lubrication. Um, I do not register as having dysfunction on that scale. And I think that's really problematic. And I think that probably a lot of women who don't have dysfunction would register as having dysfunction because it's very dependent on what expectations people have about how their bodies it's are. More psychological rather than like the physiological experience. Yeah. So I really think the anatomy and physiology of female sexual function is very neglected. As another example, the course of the dorsal nerves in the clitoris is omitted from the most authoritative textbook on female sexual function and dysfunction. What? Like, this is so wild to even consider as being a reality. Like, it really is crazy. The author has been a big supporter of mine. So I'm confident that if they come out with a new edition, it will be included. However, it is crazy that it was omitted in the first place. It is. I'm curious, like, what is, what do we all need to know about the clitoris and about all, like, what do we all need to know? Well, as far as just lay people go, I guess. Um, the most important thing to know is that direct external clitoral stimulation is the most reliable route to orgasm for 96% of women. 
And I think that women need to know that whatever they need to orgasm is valid. They deserve equal pleasure in sexual encounters. I think, you know, it gets disturbing sometimes how uncomfortable women are asking for what they need and ask, you know, requiring that their partners do what it takes to give them equal pleasure or at least do what they can, you know? Um, I think that's really important. And I think, you know, it's, I think female sexual pleasure is super important to relationships. Um, there is one study that shows that women who don't orgasm during sexual encounters, they don't experience much increase in oxytocin levels, while women who do experience a very significant increase. And so what that means is that women who are not orgasming are physiologically less capable of bonding in, in these encounters. And that, you know, I don't, I definitely don't want to make anyone who's not orgasming feel bad, but to me, that really speaks to the importance of female sexual pleasure in bonding and in relationships. And I think anecdotally, a lot of people know that if women are sexually satisfied it really helps the relationship. I mean, a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I can't, I mean, I don't mean like I'm speaking for women, but I, it makes sense from a psychological perspective, a relational perspective. So there's an orgasm gap where 95% of heterosexual men are orgasming most or all of the time in sexual encounters and only 65% of heterosexual women are. And some people like to blame this on biology, but I think it is largely due to culture. Mm -hmm. um, 85% of lesbians orgasm most or all of the time in sexual encounters. So there is that gap between the yeah, experiences. Sure. Yeah. So at the very least, we could get heterosexual women up to the orgasm frequency of lesbians. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a good movement. I think a lot of people will agree with this uh, prioritization or intention. Yeah. The other thing that I was going to say regarding what we were talking about with medicine is medical error is very common. And through my advocacy and through everything that I've learned from looking into medical literature and training standards, I believe that most medical errors are due to systemic problems that are theoretically easy to solve but don't get solved due to denial, ego, and politics. Mm. And that is just my opinion. You know, I can't prove it, obviously, but it is what I suspect based on how there is really, there are really clear systemic reasons for why what happened to me happened. And they continue to lead to errors that harm other women and nothing changes. There's no feedback. Right. There's no learning from mistakes. And I really think there is, there is a lack of feedback in medicine. There is a lack of learning from errors. And um, years ago, I was reading a lot of literature on safety engineering and how in other fields like aviation and nuclear power, they have better systems in place for learning from mistakes than they do in medicine. And I think that, um, you know, there is a lot of senseless preventable error in medicine that goes on. And that should be a reason for distrust. And it should be something that gets addressed so that mistakes are learned from. And there has been some effort to address this. Um, however, I think it is a fundamental problem that medicine is self-governing and self-policing um, because doctors don't tend to police each other very well unfortunately. So yeah, I think that's a difference between medicine and other fields and also the way that medical liability works in medicine. I can never figure out a way to address any of the problems I see through any legal mechanism. You know, like I've tried contacting lawyers about how false information gets published and used to market procedures. And it doesn't seem like there's anything that can be done about that. And it just seems kind of crazy. Um, and also how anatomy isn't being taught. I think that clitoral anatomy gets omitted from medical education for fundamentally the same reasons as it gets omitted from sex education. And that is the cultural suppression of female sexuality. 
But I also think that a huge problem is how people have separated sexual pleasure from reproduction, at least in females. And I don't think that they should be separate. I think that the clitoris should be considered reproductive anatomy. And I think that not counting it as reproductive anatomy is a denial of female sexual agency. Um, and the reason I think this is because we know that the number, sorry. Okay. The reason I think this is because we know that the number one reason females have sex is for pleasure. And we know that the clitoris is the organ most responsible for female pleasure. And so the clitoris is the organ most responsible for motivating reproductive activity in females, yet we don't consider it reproductive. And that's crazy to me. And sometimes people will point to how, you know, women in cultures that practice ritual female genital mutilation still reproduce. But I think this requires entire systems of cultural coercion. And I yeah. think you know, for most of human evolution, we didn't even have cultures, right? So I don't think you can say that the clitoris is not, you know, motivational for reproductivity or for reproduction, because in cultures where it is removed or, uh, you know, there's different forms of female genital mutilation, that they still have babies because they also might not be having sex for pleasure and it, i mean there's so many confounding factors in that argument so i agree with you like it's just by removing it you can't say well then in those cultures they still have babies it's like yeah but they also might have more cultural motivations and just be seen as places of production and also pleasure centers for men you know yeah but so the main reason why the clitoris gets omitted yeah. or, sorry one, one, oh main, one main reason why the clitoris, sorry, one main reason why clitoral anatomy gets omitted from medical education and from sex education is because it's not seen as reproductive anatomy. Yeah. I mean, I've actually had medical students argue that detailed clitoral anatomy or detailed anatomy for the vulva in general is not covered in their general anatomy because the vulva is not reproductive and because female orgasms are not as medically relevant as male orgasms. And I fundamentally disagree with that. Yeah, I, I agree too. But this same, I mean, you would be surprised how many women even endorse this argument that the vulva is not important to reproduction. And it doesn't make sense. And what I've asked my followers to imagine is what sex would be like and what their relationships would be like if they didn't have a clitoris. It sounds like you're building an army and a movement. And uh, I'm a big fan and supporter of your work. And that's why I wanted to have you on because I really support your message. And I'm curious, like for the people listening, how, like if they want to reach out to you or how do they find out more from you? Where do they follow you? All that kind of stuff. Um, I am on Instagram at Jessica underscore and a n n underscore pin P I N. And I am on TikTok under the same. And I am Mediclit on Twitter, M E D I C L I T. Um, in my bio on Instagram, I have a bunch of links to podcasts I've done and to a petition that I have for the American College of OBGYN to dictate that nerves in the clitoris be taught. Um, I would really appreciate anyone signing that petition. Yeah, we'll put the link here in the show notes and I'll make sure I share it on Instagram too. All right. 